for our sailors, the United States Navy. Eternal Lord God, who alone spread us out the heavens and rulest the raging of the sea, watch safe to take into thy almighty and most gracious protection in our country's navy and all who serve therein. Preserve them from the dangers of the sea and from the violence of any enemy, that they may be a safeguard unto the United States of America and a security for such as pass on the seas upon their lawful occasions, that the inhabitants of our land may live in peace and quietness and serve thee, our God, to the glory of thy name, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Well, we're on various holy days and various occasions, hymn 232. The Nativity of St. John the Baptist. All praise for John the Baptist, forerunner of the word, one true Elijah, making a highway for the Lord. The last and greatest prophet, he saw the dawning ray of light that grows in splendor until the perfect day. Well, we turn our attention to uh, Professor Gordon Kaufman's Systematic Theology, a Historistic Perspective. He's a professor at Harvard for um, 30 years. He's got a title here, Brenda Biggs, 402 Hodge Hall. It's probably Princeton. Uh, <clears throat> He's a Mennonite. By church affiliation, a lot of blank pages here. Relativism, knowledge, and faith. I think that was what his doctoral dissertation was on at Yale. Relativism. taught from 1963 to 1993, and died in 2011. So he's a 20th century systematician. 1968, this was published, wow. Five years after being at Harvard for Dorothy, intuitive theologian. <laughs> That's like my wife, she's an intuitive theologian. Good, good title. Preface, the appearance of a new work in Christian systematic theology calls perhaps for some justification on the part of the author. This is particularly the case today, a time of rapid cultural change, fragmentation, and even chaos. The proper context for such work, many contend, is a more orderly and stable cultural period when faith knows itself well and is able to express itself with conviction. In our own time of religious doubt and cultural pluralism, the most that we can or should attempt are pieces of occasional theology, tracts for the times, hortatory or critical essays. My conviction, however, is that precisely in this time of confusion and doubt, we need not only insightful essays on this or that aspect of Christian tradition or this or that contemporary problem, but new proposals which set forth Christian faith in the round. We need to see whether Christian faith has an integrity and a consistency of its own, which make it worthy of our attention. Can you imagine uh, Bruno, whom we quoted this morning, or John of Damascus, whom we quoted yesterday, talking like this? We need to see whether it is possible for thinking oriented on the Christ event to make sense of the great variety of intellectual, cultural, and religious currents of our time. He's already drinking the relativistics, I think. We'll see. I'm going to give him a fair hearing. Uh, give him a chance to present himself. What is required is exposition of Christian faith and its wholeness, enabling us to see how our entire modern existence, political, scientific, pride, when grasped,
in Christian terms, only systematic theologies drawing on the vast linguistic and conceptual resources of Christian doctrine, which was developed to interpret all sides of human experience and speak to such needs. It's already talking too long. It's very much to be hoped that a number of systematic statements of Christian doctrine, each with its distinctive proposal for understanding the significance and import of Christian faith for contemporary life will appear in the next few years. <laughs> what was the matter with uh, what was the matter with Charles Hodge? Yeah, I might not like a few things here and there, but is that inadequate? So we need another one. Or W G H T shed. What's the matter here? If non-Christian faith itself may be coming to its end as a significant human reality, what tarnation? Theological work is not merely the uncritical rehearsal of tradition. It is rather in each new instance a creative act, seeking to deal with the most problematical dimensions of human existence. It is an act and work, therefore, that scarcely can be avoided by men, if not under the title of theology, then some other name. The value of a new attempt at a systematic theology will arise from its alleged finality, not, not from its alleged finality, nor from irrefutable arguments with which it fells opponents, whether agnostic or explicitly theological. It will depend rather on the degree in which it succeeds in defining, clarifying, and comprehending the questions about the meaning of life and destiny. How about Westminster Shorter Catechism here, uh, Gordon? Man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy him and have fun. Good grief. Oh, yes. Christian theology being rooted in and an attempt to explicate Christian faith seeks to grasp our common human existence in the light of God's revelation in Jesus Christ. It should not be supposed, however, that this implies a deliberate submission to heteronymous authority, whether church, Bible, or even God. Oh, imagine Augustine sitting down with his boy at Harvard, or Thomas Cranmer, or John Calvin. Oh, we're not going to submit to scriptures, Gord tells us. Oh, brother. It's 580 pages of him relativizing and opining. A thinker may never give up his moral and epistemological autonomy, integrity for the search of truth. <laughs> this guy ever exegete Romans 1 18 to 32? Where's God in all of this? It's all about him. Oh, brother, I bear with my impatience with this guy. He can recognize and honestly declare as true only what he himself can perceive to be the truth. However, no man searching out this difficult path cuts an entirely new, untried trail. Each is heavenly, de heavily dependent on the work and insights of those who've gone before. Indeed, for the most part, one's intellectual work is a rediscovery of landmarks others have pointed out. Inevitably, he thinks and works in terms of some tradition, some point of view, some basic orientation, what distinguishes the Christian theologian from many philosophers is his conscious awareness of the tradition which sustains his thought and his explicit acknowledgement of dependence on the events which created and formed that tradition. His work is rooted in the conviction that it is through an understanding of those events that the real meaning of human existence is grasped. Hence, the concern of theology to relate those decisive events to contemporary existence arises not out of slavish subservience to external authority, 
but out of sincere and responsible pursuit of truth itself. So we got a, a man running his own show, you know, making a little claim that he's coming out of a tradition. God, uh, yeah, you, we may let you in here a little bit. It's really about me trying to find you, God. It is important to distinguish between the perspective that informs a systematic theology and the detailed analysis of theological doctrines. wonder what Robert Dabney would think of this. Hen James Henley Thornwall. B.B. Warfield. I wonder if we'll even get a mention of these guys. A theologian's perspective affects the way he frames questions as well as the answers he gives them. It shapes his fundamental judgments regarding what is theologically important as well as his way of resolving issues. So it's the, the ego trinity, I, me, and my. It works at every level of his thinking from the simplest statements to the most comprehensive judgments. His perspective is, in short, the most important determinant in his thinking, though often it remains concealed and unknown even to the theologian himself. A Christian theologian, of course, will seek to make his perspective Christian. I'm reminded of, who was it we quoted the other day on Romans? Mark them or, or devi divisive, just mark them. Because they'll be bringing in a lot of flattering words that are without apostolic stuff. In theological work, it is just as ne necessary, therefore, to attend to the question of theological perspective. He's a relativist. A systematic theology is essentially an attempt to state as concisely and straightforwardly as possible a theological perspective. Well, if you want conciseness, the last guy we read, the Moravian, was pretty concise. Whether we agree with everything, but at least you know where he's coming from. It is therefore more concerned with systematic interrelatedness than fine points of doctrine, more attentive to underlying presuppositions than to detailed explications of dogma. This guy's what, uh, 35 years old, four years old when he writes this? Thus a theological system, as Paul Tillich has suggested, stands between a summa and an essay, like a summa, it must grapple with the whole of Christian doctrine, not merely with some one aspect of it. And its concern is not to be comprehensive in the sense of covering all theological issues. Instead, it attempts to make clear the central point of view of the Christian faith and thought, leaving the details, however important, for exposition and discussion elsewhere. Precisely because a systematic theology is directed toward depicting and clarifying the fundamental perspective of the Christian faith, it is also appropriate vehicle for conveying a particular theologian's perspective on that faith, including you, uh, Gord. For here one can see clearly which problems he takes to be crucial and which are peripheral, how he relates the various theological disciplines to each other, how he interprets critical controversial issues, in short, how he theologizes. Moreover, the questions of theological methods so troublesome in the contemporary scene come into sharp focus here since the compact structure of systematic theology makes it possible to see not only the procedures through which a theologian defines it resolves his problems, but also the consequences these procedures have. Oh, alas, it's a long read, 580 pages. This better pick up these particular characteristics and objectives of a systematic theology must be taken into account when evaluating it. It would not be appropriate, for example, 
to criticize a work in systematic theology merely for omitting discussion of some familiar doctrine. The objective here is not to be comprehensive, nor would it be especially significant to point out that rather unusual interpretations of certain doctrines are being proposed. The objective of systematic theology is not simply to repeat traditional views, but rather to grasp and think through the central claims of the Christian faith afresh, and one should expect this produce, to produce novel or even offensive interpretations. There are two pr primary questions addressed to any systematic theology. What understanding of Christian faith is here being proposed? What positive merit has this understanding and what are its limitations or deficiencies? Give me my confession. This is not going to be an exposition of the Westminster Standards or any of the other 21 forms of Reformed unity or the Book of Common Prayer. How has this understanding of faith expressed itself in the theological method? Has the theological method been carried through consistently? Of course, these questions about overall perspective and method cannot be dealt with apart <coughs> from considering how the various doctrines have been employed and interpreted. But it is possible and appropriate to evaluate and criticize the interpretation of individual doctrines only after and as one sees how they are related to and expressive of the central claims about method and perspective. Before one can properly ask whether the conception of predestination is adequate or correct, one must see why and how it follows from the central connections made about Christian faith. And then the critical question becomes not so much whether the doctrine of predestination really means something different, as whether the understanding of faith expressed in this interpretation is adequate or deficient. The big guy's got a question mark written in like. I am aware that at a number of critical points, my views depart sharply from received conceptions, but I hope no critic will think it particularly significant to point out this fact. In other words, let me just be wrong, but don't point it out. <laughs> oh. Oh, good. Well, just keep going here. Oh, I may depart from you. Maybe just dead wrong. Maybe a heresy, but don't point it out. I don't know. But my chief concerns here have been to state a point of view as sharply as possible and to work out the full implications for Christian faith with the greatest methodological self awareness and thoroughness that I could bring to the task. The present work has been composed in the conviction that many of the problems, both of contemporary theology and of Christian witness to the contemporary world, are rooted in a great fogginess about the theological conceptions of history, historical knowledge, and revelation. Although much is said about the significance of the fact that Christianity is a historical religion, quote-unquote, Seldom is the full import of these words carried through consistently into every crevice and corner of the theological interpretation of faith. Moreover, the relationship between Heil's Geschichte, with which the Christian faith is especially concerned, and the ordinary workaday secular history, I already can tell you he's using the word secular history, there is no secular history, already tells me this guy's not reformed. Too bad. So, despite its interest in history, the Christian faith appears to many moderns to be, in fact, completely irrelevant to the only history which they know. Oh, okay. So Christian relevance is determined by a layman. This guy. The interpretation of the Christian faith faith found in this work seeks to meet the problem by giving at every point a radically historistic view of the Christian perspective and its major doctrines. By this, I do not mean to suggest that we shall approach the faith from some perspective alien to it. 
evaluating it by norms drawn from some secular. Now we got a footnote. I am aware, of course, that the term historicism has been used in a variety of ways to indicate this or that interpretation of history, including positivism, historical determinism, historical relativism. And using this term, I am not seeking to identify my views. No, because we want to hide those. And, this, and yet, at other times, we want to be clear and concise. Long talking. I use the word simply because it suggests a viewpoint that understands the world in historical terms and man in terms of the radical implications of his historicity. Whatever that means. But in his radical theological history, rooted in millions, thousands of details because of providence. We haven't heard anything about divine providence. We'll see. And it is precisely this kind of viewpoint that the present analysis attempts to express. Because the late Carl Michelson used the same term to de designate his theological stance, I should perhaps mention here immediately that the meaning he gave to the term, as well as the theological position he developed, differ very substantially from the views set forth in this volume. The theological revolution of the last generation has taught us that such procedures are fatal for theology. Or rather, I propose here to take the allegedly historical character of Christian faith with absolute seriousness, exploring as a kind of experiment in thought, Kierkegaard, what the various Christian doctrines mean when understood essentially as attempts to grapple with and interpret the nature and meaning of history and man's historicity and what man's historical existence looks like when its structure is analyzed with the aid of key concepts found in the Christian tradition. If through this procedure many of the obscurities and supposed absurdities of Christian doctrine become intelligible themselves and illuminative of our existence, we can consider our hypothesis of the radically historical character of Christianity in some measure confirmed. If, however, interpretation of Christian doctrine in this historicist vein appears often forced and misleading, the hypothesis will need reformulation, or perhaps must even be discarded entirely. In any case, no attempt is being made here to impose some alien perspective on faith. Rather, we are seeking to uncover and develop a perspective inherent in the Christian faith itself. How about Jesus' view of the Old Testament? Paul's view of the Old Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John's view of the Old Testament. I haven't heard anything about Moses' law, the apostles, prophets. A lot of long talk, and we're on page 17. Well, it's anabaptistic, right? Self-absorbed. In order fully to justify the claim that this interpretation of Christian faith within the limits of history alone, to adapt the phrase of Kant, can properly be called Christian theology, one must have to show in some detail its continuity with the important statements of the Christian faith from the biblical literature to the present. Such a program would require not only learning far greater than mine, but also such a mass of cumbersome historical interpretation and detailed documentation as to defeat my purpose of presenting in a relatively compact scope and interpretation of the Christian perspective Indeed, we're such tempted, my desire to set forth clearly the unity and consistency of Christian faith when seen in historistic terms would have been swallowed up by the proliferation of detailed argumentation. 
I have therefore not presented the kind of full documentation which in last analysis would be required to substantiate this aspect of the present argument. For this reason, I have avoided much explicit discussion of principal alternative positions and contempt the contemporary theological scheme. Let us pray. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Godspeed.